we have an incredible guest, Elise Hoag, president of NARAL, N-A-R-A-L, you may have seen it, Pro-Choice America since February 2013, where she leads efforts to expand access to abortion and to educate. She also happens to be the author of The Lie That Binds. Thank you so much for joining us, Elise. So happy to be here, Adrian. thank you. Yes, and congrats on your new book. It's number one new release, Amazon Social Policy Section, just published July 22nd. The, the lie that binds, it seems to really set the record straight on how radical forces use misogyny, racism, and disinformation. How would you describe your work that you put out? <laughs> you know, we were really hoping to tell a history that came into current day and reveal that the central lie on the radical right is that they are driven by some sort of moral concern for the outcomes of individual pregnancies as they would have you believe. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. They created a whole agenda about maintaining power for a small minority, propping up a white patriarchy um, in a changing world. And they found out that abortion would be a good dog whistle, a Pavlovian response that would allow them to move this regressive agenda and use reproductive oppression as a tool of control. Yeah, and it really does seem that way since we've seen kind of the rise of abortion being weaponized and used against groups. And you know, you suggest that we're in the midst of this all out assault on reproductive freedom and Roe v. Wade, you know, hanging by a thread. What do you want people to know more about that? <laughs> what we want people to know is A, that that's real, right? That uh, even though the vast majority of people in this country believe that decisions about individual pregnancy should be left to the person who is pregnant and those that they trust, um, that in fact the radical right is on the verge of not just banning legal abortion in this country, but using it as a Trojan horse to move an agenda that it opposes all sorts of social policy. And in fact, Adrian, because I'm such a big fan of yours and know all about your work in your book, quite honestly, you know, the radical right came to oppose abortion pretty late in the game. They mobilized to political action, fighting school desegregation, and then they sort of moved to defeat the ERA because they're hostile to gender equity. And in fact, when they gathered on a conference call in 1978, kind of casting about for a new issue to be the tip of the spear, they really thought about using contraception because Contraception was allowing women to enter the workplace and challenge them for power, just as you did, right? And they didn't like uppity women wanting access to the C-suite and wanting workplaces free of sexual harassment, wanting pay equity. But they found that contraception was a little too popular and didn't carry that same sort of stigma that would buy silence even from the majority of people who supported legal access to abortion and contraception. And so they landed on abortion, but it's all a Trojan horse. What they want is women kept in their place and they wanna keep control for a very small number. They wanna prop up the white patriarchy in a changing world. And they've been pretty effective at it. Oh, absolutely, I think they've been very effective at it and finding these ways to really kind of just Make sure we stay at home in the kitchen. We're economically, you know, reliant on men, and it is—it's a very special place to be in when you can see all of this that's going on. And I know you can see it based on your work, everything you do and represent. And so, you know, it seems like we're almost moving toward this dystopian *Handmaid's Tale* society, you know, where women are subordinate, force breeders, and whatnot. Could you really see something like this going down if we don't have enough advocates in place? I, I could, but you know, the other thing we really want people to take away from the book, and there's a podcast by the same name that's really awesome coming out uh, next week, um, is that Trump is the ultimate manifestation of this movement that has been in place for 45 years to block social progress. He is not the originator of it, he's not the architect of it, he's not even that smart that he could do that, but he is the manifestation. And what we see under Trump is a reconvergence of white supremacists, online misogynists, the traditional anti-choice movement all converging to rob all people of fundamental freedoms. And in the process, because they don't have popular support, they are undermining democracy. 
We all know this, right? They're capturing the courts, always part of their broad plan. They're using voter suppression because when you are a smaller and smaller minority and you represent a smaller and smaller minority, you are gonna use all means within your control to maintain power. So yes, I can see gender oppression taking much more hold, just like I can see, you know, immigrant rights going away, you know, the progress that we've made and the racial justice uprising. Um, you know, being quelled in terrible undemocratic ways as we're seeing on the streets of Portland. All of that is very real. There is no civilization in history that didn't embrace fascist, proto-fascist, authoritarian views that didn't also embrace gender and racial oppression. Absolutely, and that's very, very scary. Um, recently, you wrote that since racism and misogyny have always been tangled in American society, Finding the right balance that kept just enough women on board was key to success. What did you mean by that? <laughs> well, as a white woman, I have a rallying cry for other white women, which is that we have been, too many of us, I should say, um, have been complicit. Right, And we have seen from Phyllis Schlafly all the way to Kellyanne Conway that they will slap a white woman as the face of this movement to prop up the white patriarchy. They will foment entrenched racism as a way to keep us adherent to our tribe just enough to win electorally. We tracked it through the Reagan years in the book. We saw the same thing in 2016 and white women have got to educate themselves. They've got to call this stuff out. We cannot afford the same thing in 2020. And you don't want to be Kellyanne Conway. You don't want to be Susan Collins. You don't want to be a face of this oppression of other women and people of color. Absolutely, it seems like they have a whole pick me, pick me stance. And they're willing to sacrifice as many people and people of color, of course, just to make sure that they're taken care of. And what do you think- The power is not worth it. It's totally. done, we're over it. And, and it's interesting, you'd think people would uh, have recognized that even as we've seen Trump's former comrades fall to the wayside um, just because they got to be with him when he was powerful. And then we know how things turned out, a la Michael Cohen. But in terms of white women and really getting the message home to them that they can't just stand up for feminism, they also need to be invested in ending racism. What do you think can be done to reach this populace that's really enjoyed the protection of white supremacy and the patriarchy, arguably for some time? I mean, our top prescription in the book after doing all of this massive amount of research and study is to break the silence. You know, part of what they did is build this Trojan horse around issues that, are, that we have traditionally had discomfort to talk about, right? Abortion is stigmatized, but abortion is not the problem. Abortion is a medical procedure. Women who have sex outside of procreation, we don't talk about that. There's a lot of stigma there still in our society. Overlay race on that, right? And what Reagan did in the 80s, stigmatizing single moms and the black communities as though structural racism wasn't totally responsible for the breakup of families. We have got to start speaking this truth un- peeling back the layers of the onion that they had built and demanding people choose sides. The good news is more and more are the defections of women writ large and certainly white women from what is an overtly racist, misogynist GOP under Trump has been steadily increasing since 2016. And just this week, there was a um, article about evangelical women saying that they've had enough with Trump. We have got to reclaim the narrative and it's, it's so crucial to beat Trump, but it's not enough because it has got to make, we've got to make this moment transformative. We've got to build a better future out of it. Oh, absolutely. And since we only have a few minutes left, I wanted you know viewers to kind of get to know you just a little bit. So <laughs> I have a favorite question I like to ask because I do not like to ride behind cars that have ladders on top. And I also am really kind of iffy around a garbage disposal, a la what Amityville <laughs> uh, kind of thing. So what is your most irrational fear? Um, I don't find it irrational, but um, cockroaches. I think okay. that I try to go out of my way not to kill them because I don't want their millions of relatives to come back and take revenge. Um, I think that's a really irrational fear. And then as a child, I grew up in a landlocked state. 
but I had recurring nightmares that a truck was gonna come dump a shark into the swimming pool that we were swimming in. And I was smart enough to know the chlorine would kill it, but I figured it could chomp me just before that happened. But I really like how you had this logical reasoning of thinking, you know, the chlorine would get it, would be <laughs> fine. Like I really, because that's a lot of investment in an irrational fear. That's really good though. I, I am still a Virgo, even in my irrationality. That is all right. I support it. Not everybody can be a Leo, but that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> all right. Now let me ask you, where can people find you and your book? So I am on Twitter at Elise.h, I-L-Y-S-E-H. But find the book at the lie that binds dot Com. We are thrilled at the public reception of it. We wanted to contribute to a crucial conversation going on in this country. We're thrilled to have been labeled a bestseller. We hope you will buy it. We hope you will use it as a tool for change, not just to sit on your bookshelf. The lie that binds.com. You heard her, Elise Hogue, The Lie That Binds. It's already a bestseller out there. You go get it. Thank you so much for coming by, Elise. Thank you, Adrian, for all you do. The TYT Plus app is now available on iOS and Android. Download to get more TYT content at tyt.com slash app.